Well, we've just been reading about a, another happy wedding day. And how amazing it must have been that the Lord Jesus Christ himself was there at that wedding. Now, in one sense, Jesus is there at every wedding, whether it takes place in a church building, in a registry office, in some other building or in the open air, wherever people gather, God is. He's present everywhere all the time. So whenever some, someone is getting married, God is there. And it's uh, an, an occasion to recognize that. But uh, the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, was physically present in that wedding. What a blessing that must have been to uh, the family and the guests. And it's our prayer every time a couple get married that Jesus would be there in their relationship, in their marriage, in their future. So the Lord Jesus Christ was there. And also it tells us in this passage that Mary, his mother, was there. And uh, his disciples, at least some of the disciples, were there. Now, the wedding services traditionally in that culture would have lasted a whole week. I don't think I could have kept at that sort of pace. <laughs> One day was intense enough for me. But a whole week of celebrations, can you imagine that? And so you would have needed to have stocked up pretty well on food supplies and drinks. So you can well imagine, I'm sure, that uh, by the end of the week, things were running dry and uh, running out. And so there was no wine left. Um, now, Mary took the initiative to approach Jesus, her son, on this issue. And she was concerned, um, I'm sure, out of compassion for the family. Uh, maybe they were close relatives or friends of Mary, but she was, was certainly concerned about that situation and wanted to do something about it. And so she approached the Lord Jesus and she, um, she told him, they have no wine. It's there in verse three. Now, Jesus's response might seem to us a bit strange and even a bit abrupt or even uh, dismissive of her. Jesus said to her in verse four, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, we'll, we'll come to think about why he said that and put that across in that way in a moment. But first of all, let's just hold on to one thought, which is the gist of what Mary was suggesting here, um, that in that situation of need, her first response was to tell Jesus. And I wonder in our lives, whatever situations we come up against, is that our first response? To come to the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer, to tell Jesus of the situation. We can organise and we can work things out in our own wisdom and we can rush into things, but do we stop and think, to tell Jesus about it. Lord Jesus, will you help in this situation? Because it's way beyond me and my wisdom. So it's a simple thought, but it's a, an important one there. That's our first point this morning, that whatever situations we face in our lives, let's stop and pray and tell the Lord Jesus about it. And that's what Mary did. And, and that was commendable. That was a good thing for her to do. And we can approach the Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> in prayer at any time. We don't need an invitation. We don't need an appointment. We can come any time, day or night in any situation and cry out to him in prayer, just as we would talk to a dear friend. We don't come flippantly to him. We don't come um, in a casual way, uh, but we do come uh, with joy and 
with, with thankfulness, recognizing that we're welcome in his sight. And so we can draw near to him without fear and approach him because he has made that way open in prayer for us. So, as we said, it seemed in verse four that Jesus's response was a bit abrupt and strange. Why did he respond like this? He didn't seem to want to help at first on the surface of things. And yet Mary persisted. She knew that he would help. And I think we need to understand this in a, a bigger context, the way that he responds there in verse four. He wasn't being rude in any sense. He wasn't being disrespectful. He had great respect for his mother. And we, we can see that and great affection too. We can see that later on in particular when in, in the crucifixion, in all his agony and the intensity of everything that he was going through, his thoughts were not about himself, but about his dear mother. And he made sure that his close friend, the Apostle John, would look after her uh, when he was no longer with her. And so he has great concern for his mother, great respect for her. Um, and, and this was not a disrespectful way to speak. But what he is pointing out here is that he has come to earth with a mission from his heavenly father. And that the timing of that is all under the sovereign command of the living God. And he knew that in God's timetable, it was not yet time for his enemies to take him and put him to death. My hour has not yet come. So what he's saying is that um, it was not yet time for him to be openly and widely recognized as the son of God just yet, because um, that time would come in God's plan. And so his mother then in verse five responds by telling the servants that were serving at the wedding, whatever he says to you, do it. And here's another application for us in our lives. Whatever the Lord Jesus Christ tells us to do, will we do it? Will we obey the commands of, of God's word, of our saviour, of his father and our father in heaven? Will we obey the will of God? Mary tells the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Sometimes the commands of God that he gives to us um, may seem strange or they may seem confusing or we, we may be prone to question why are we being commanded to do this but do we trust that the Lord knows best that what he commands he commands for a good reason and we must be willing to humbly submit to his will and do whatever he, he tells us to do Abraham did that, didn't he? In the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 22, he was so uh, perplexed and overwhelmed by what God was commanding him to do, to take his own dear, dearly loved son to the mountain, to offer him there as a sacrifice. And yet, of course, God intervened. God stepped in and provided the substitute. Uh, a ram was killed in place of Isaac. But Abraham trusts and obeys the voice of the Lord, though it went against all his reasoning. And sometimes the Lord puts us into situations where we can't understand why is he, why is he wanting this of me? And yet he knows best and he asks you, in fact, he commands you to do whatever he says, because that is right. That is his will for you. So, yes, tell Jesus of our concerns, of our joys, of our problems, whatever is happening in our lives. Let's come to him in prayer. But then secondly, to do what he, in his commands, in his word, tells us, whatever that might be. So in this case, the uh, command from Jesus was to 
uh, to take the six water pots that were uh, there for the purpose of ceremonial washing. Remember, um, before Jewish people could eat a meal, they had to go through this ritual of washing ceremonially and cleansing according to uh, their laws and the, the Old Testament commands there. And so Jesus tells the servants to fill the six water pots. Now, they would have been very, very large water pots, um, not small ones. They, they would have been large uh, water pots that would stand probably so high and um, there would be a lot of water uh, that they could contain, made out of stone normally. And so this was the command. Uh, there were six water pots, it says, of stone, verse 6, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. So that's a lot of water in each one. Jesus said, fill those water pots with water. So the servants did what he commanded. They filled them up to the brim. And he said to them then, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. So again, they obeyed that instruction. And um, when, when they filled, when they, when they dipped rather the, uh, the cup into that um, vessel of water and brought it to the master of the feast to taste it, you, you can almost picture his face. You can almost imagine the surprise and the shock when he realised uh, the the water had been turned into wine. Well, he didn't, he didn't know that. It tells us he didn't know where it came from, but he certainly knew it was good wine. And not only was it wine, it was the best wine. And he makes the comment, everyone at the beginning sets out good wine. That was the usual... Um, practice that you would put the best wine out first and then when the guests have have relaxed and, and they've they've uh, they've drunk well then perhaps their senses are not quite so tuned and they might not realize that the the wine isn't so good towards the end of the celebration but that that certainly um was not the case here that the good wine that he, he had tasted was the best and it was left until the last. Just as an aside, really, and, a, and, a, and another thought that we could apply. It's not the central thought here, but it's, it's one that we could just apply in one sense. That um, in the Christian gospel, the best is yet to come. Uh, what we enjoy here now as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, the joy of eternal life peace with God, fellowship with one another. That is a wonderful thing. But that's not the best. The best is yet to come because one day we will be in the perfection of heaven, free from sin and all its effects, free from death. We will be in the fullness of all that God has purposed for us in Christ. And he saves the best for his people till the end. So tell Jesus of our concerns, do whatever he says to you. And um, then the third thought is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was the response when uh, this miracle, and it was the first miracle that Jesus ever carried out, uh, when it took place, that was the response that we read here in verse 11. This beginning of signs, it was the first miracle that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee uh, and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. That was their response. They believed in him. Here is someone who has the power of God. Here is someone who is from God whether they fully understood all the implications of what that meant, that he was actually divine, he, he was God who'd become man. I think that understanding will perhaps come late, later on, but 
they certainly recognised that Jesus was the Saviour, he was the Lord that they must follow. And I wonder this morning if that is our response, each one of us, that we have witnessed many, many miracles, miracles of saving grace in people's lives, people who once walked far from the Lord and now love him and trust him and live their lives for him. That's a miracle. We've seen answers to our prayers in the most remarkable ways. We've, we've seen the evidence of God's word. When we read it, it has a ring of authority and wisdom which no human thoughts could ever bring. We've heard, we've witnessed the reality that the powerful, the all-powerful, all-wise Son of God has entered our world and he's come to be a saviour. He's laid down his life on the cross and he's risen again to resurrection life. We've seen the evidence. Will we believe? Will you believe in him as your own saviour and friend and Lord? Will you live the rest of your life here on earth for him? And then the joy of that wedding feast of the Lamb is to come. The best is yet to come.